This episode is brought to you by MPB. Get cash for the kit you're not using or trade it in for the gear you want at mpb.com. In this interview, I'm speaking with Elia Locardi. We're gonna be talking about getting yourself back into photography. This is Twit. Hey, welcome back to another episode of This Week in Photo. I'm your host, Frederick Van Johnson. Today, I have the honor of sitting down with Elia Locardi. Elia is, uh, he is the quintessential photographer. He's one of the photographers that a lot of us wish we were. Traveling the world, amazing portfolio of work. He knows his way around a camera or two, as we're going to discover in this interview. I wanted, there's so many things I can speak, I can talk to Elia about, but one of the things we discussed in kind of the pre interview, the, the green room, was let's focus this on the topic at, at hand, which is getting back into photography. If you've kind of taken a break from your photography for whatever reasons, you know, you're, and now you want to, you want to dive back into it and you're feeling a little intimidated. What are some ways that you could overcome that intimidation? So, Elia, welcome to the show, man. How are you doing? I'm pretty good. It's yeah. it's good to be back. I mean, mm-hmm. you didn't tell people that the green room was an hour and a half, and we forgot <laughs> to hit record. It totally was. That's how it happens with us, right? We we were talking, <laughs> but but in our defense, we were talking about everything from the Marvel cinema, cinematic universe to Black Mirror to. Uh, invincible to all all kinds of stuff, right? So, and then like all about marketing too, which is just wild to go from like high level marketing to uh, you know cartoons. No, no, absolutely, yeah, animation, not cartoons, Elia. Animation. Well, I call them cartoons because I, I just prefer to tell people I'm watching cartoons. Like, what are you doing? I'm watching cartoons. <laughs> what are you doing? Cartoons. I'm watching a well articulated animated series. It's like it's just yes. not. It sounds too good. You don't want to yeah. give people the impression that you watch good stuff. Yeah, I still haven't figured out what the difference between a cartoon, animation, anime, manga, you know, are, what's the difference between all these things? I'm sure somebody will tell me on social media or in the comments, but they're all drawings you, that are animated, right? You set yourself up for a, a lot of I comments, know. probably. I'm in, trouble. I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. It's all the same, people. It's all the same. Um, well, cool, man. Let's dive in. So for, for the folks that may not know, may not be familiar with Elia Locardi, who are you and what do you do? I, I kind of I kind of spilled the beans a little bit. You're a travel photographer and you know your way around the world. Uh, but for the folks that have just met you, how would you explain yourself to them? I would say that I am an aspiring travel photographer now because we, we've all been home for so long. Yeah. So, you know, previous to our, our, our home, our home stay, I was uh, I was on the road for probably about 12 years and I visited 70 countries, flew a few million miles and uh, photographed a lot of stuff to the point where I have too many hard drives and cold storage that I need to go through. <laughs> um, it's been, it's been really interesting, but yeah, mostly it was, it was travel photography. And, and I think when I got started, it was, it was sort of based on this idea that um, we always see the world in a different way. And at the time, it was sort of before social media, before mainstream social media or public social media, Twitter, Flickr, things like that. And, and it just kind of felt like I'd seen everything in National Geographic and been inspired by it. And I was talking to people, they're like, yeah, you know, you, you, there's really nothing left to do. There, there's nothing left to photograph. There's nothing left to do. And uh, my counter argument to that was, I, I think everybody says that at every point of history, like that's mm-hmm. it. And there's nothing left to do. And then you never hear from that person again, right? Because somebody takes it to the next level. So I, I wanted to do something different. I didn't know what that was. And I just kind of set out to do it. And my wife and I, we basically sold everything that we own to buy the gear we need. And then we spent five years from 2012 to 2017 location independent, which is, again, it, it's labeling homelessness, kind of like, you know, anime is cartoons. I mean, it was basically being homeless and, and traveling around the world without a, without a home base and the expenses that 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 incurred. So I just kind of started shooting things, figuring it out and applying all of the years that I had from motion design and Photoshop and all that kind of stuff. And just sort of learning and discovering the world and and producing work. And and that sort of evolved over time. Uh, And it's one of those things that I just, I constantly reevaluate. And I just, I constantly try to not reinvent myself, but make sure that I approach everything with that same curiosity, you know, 15 years ago when I thought like, I'd love to travel the world. I wasn't 
thinking like, I'd love to travel the world and then have this conversation with Frederick 15 years later, you know, about how I traveled the world. I'm thinking, <laughs> oh man, this is going to be amazing. And I don't know what's going to happen. So, uh, you know, this, this is kind of where my mindset was then and, and where it is now, uh, which is kind of interesting to, to be at a point where I'm, I'm kind of letting go of any expectations and just trying to create art again, because things have changed. I don't know if anybody noticed, but, um, bit, been a bit of a year, a bit of a, a bit of a year. Just a little bit, just a little bit. Yeah, things have shifted a little bit, which is which is interesting, right? Because I'm, this is a selfish interview, right? Because I'm these questions I'm asking, I'm asking for myself, <laughs> right? So, and I'm I'm my audience, right? So, so you know, I look at this the the world as it starts to thaw out in in many areas, not all areas, but I look at. I look at that and I'm thinking, yeah, we've been on lockdown. My wings have been clipped. I have this weird desire to just want to freaking go someplace, right? I just want to go. I don't care where it is. I'm in California and I'm like, there there are a gazillion places in California I haven't been that are a $67 Southwest ticket away. Why don't I just drop my finger on a map and just go to some random town and bring my camera and maybe a drone or something and just go shoot? Is that, is that a viable kind of way to get, ba- or is that like throwing the baby into the pool, you know, or should I, should I tiptoe and maybe go shoot around my neighborhood? What do you think? Like for the people that all are right. listening in the same well, boat. First of all, you lost me at Southwest. That, that was like a, <laughs> you already like lost me. I'm like, no, that's, that's a deal breaker right there. <laughs> well, Virgin is gone. So I, Southwest. <laughs> that's true. You're, you're a little bit more, uh, I don't know. Lim- lim- <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm risk averse. Yeah, for the for the price, you know, it works. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. So that that's a really good question. I, I think we've been challenged with that as creative. So as someone who who spent most of his life trying to get away from his home as far as possible, I mean, I, I literally use like the map tunneling tool on the internet. I was like, what's the farthest thing away from Florida? And it turned out to be in the middle of the ocean. So it wasn't going to work. <laughs> it was like, well, you know, it's like. 10, 11,000 miles away is Singapore, Southeast Asia. So I'm like, I'm going to go there, you know, I'm just going to go as far away as possible. And then everything's going to be great, you know? And, and what's, what's interesting is like, everything's different. So it stimulates you. And I, and I think that's the key is, is being stimulated. And we have this, this issue of, of treating things close to home as uninteresting. Yeah. I, I remember when I went to Stockholm for the first time, 2012, uh, was actually when we invented location dependence over coffee. We invented it there. And I, I was like reading these articles before and Naomi found these articles too about the subway system. And the, there's like this one that, that there's just like art and, and the, the T T bonus system is like this, uh, you know, open air. Well, it's not open air, very closed air cave museum. Uh, but it's pretty. And, and now everybody knows the, the escalator to hell or that, that shot in the Stockholm Metro. But when I, shot it that it wasn't really anywhere you know i mean we found this obscure article about it and i remember shooting it and i was shooting it at night you know like midnight when nobody was there and and people walking by they're like what the heck are you doing you know and swedish people like they can speak english w- w- without an an accent you know I'm like oh you're from the united states no i'm from sweden it's like oh okay but they're like what are you doing here what what are you shooting i'm like well this looks like kind of a thing and they're like no that's just an escalator Oh, like there's nothing to it. So mm-hmm. they go and use this route all the time. You know, it's nothing for them. But for me, I, I traveled all the way to Sweden and Stockholm and took a photo of a metro station. And then that photo went viral because nobody really knew it existed. So it doesn't have to be anything extraordinary. It just has to be different to us. So the key now, if you're going to go somewhere close to yourself, is you, you have to reassess that value and, and really look at something with that same creative mind. If somebody, and you see people traveling to where you live and taking out their cameras and you're like, what are they photographing? It's just a bridge or it's just this. You have to kind of see your own area with those eyes, those fresh eyes. And I think that that? that's sort of the key, you know, like, and that's, that's where I've been challenging myself. I, I, I feel bad that I haven't gone out for a while to shoot sunset. You know, it's really pretty. There's a bunch of piers, you know, there's, there's bird life. And, but I really, it's hard. And, and I think it, people are struggling with that. I think in California, like, and then, then uh, you're automatically envious, right? Like I'm like, oh, well, mm-hmm. Frederick's in California. If I was in California, you know, I'd, I'd go everywhere. And you're like, man, I'm going to Florida next week. Yeah. I'm so excited. I'm going to bring the camera. I'm like going to St. Petersburg, Florida, you know, I'm like, hmm. So it's, <laughs> it's this, you, you have to really kind of think about uh, allowing yourself to, to, whether you call it the beginner's mind, whether you call it, um, you know, putting yourself in someone's shoes or, or, or thinking uh, with somebody else's eyes or fresh eyes, 
that's where we're at right now. You know, we, we have to kind of reassess it. And and what I'm finding is some of the things closer to home um, probably would have given me the same result professionally, but but maybe not emotionally. And I think that yeah. the travel part of that is is something where we see it. You know, whether we're following Instagrammers or photographers, whatever. I mean, that's it. You know, it's like we're going somewhere. That that going somewhere. So if you can have that feeling at home, you're going to create great work. Yeah, but it's not easy. That's the hard part, though, right? A lot of it's you hit it right on the head. Like I'm, I'm in the Bay Area, um, kind of in the Bay Area, right? So uh, about an hour, maybe less than two hours away from me, there's there's Yosemite, there's Napa, Sonoma, there's San Francisco, there's Oakland. Uh, you know, I could jump on a plane and be in Vegas pretty quickly. So there's there's all these different Death Valley, L.A. So, you know, there's all these different areas that are relatively close to me. And then in my own little neighborhood here, there's windmills and all kinds of things to to photograph. But like, for example, if I go if I go look at the Golden Gate Bridge, you know, the thing that pops into my head when I look at the Golden Gate Bridge is this thing has been photographed from every conceivable angle already, what could I possibly bring to the table? So it kind of kind of deflates the umbrella or the balloon of creativity when you feel like someone has probably stood exactly with their feet in the where my feet are sitting with the lens focal length that I have and maybe taken a better picture than I could do. Do I really want to do that? I want to do something that someone hasn't done before. So you have that that kind of overhead of, you know, can I do something different? But the travel piece pops in where even if it's a random little Western town, you know, a dirt road Western town in California, it still feels different, right? It feels like you're, you're out of your environment and the fact that it's not, it's, it's temporary. Like you're going to, you're only going to be there for a day or two days. It adds a little special seasoning on your creativity of like, okay, I may not ever come back to this place in my life, so I need to do something versus, say, the Golden Gate Bridge, which is amazing looking, but it's always there. You know, I can it's go there tomorrow. There. It's always there. So how do you how do you combat that piece of it as a traveling, you know, photographer? Um, well, you hit it on the head there, too. Um, well, you have to think about it this way, too. And this is where I have have mostly failed while I've been here. There, there's unique challenges with photographing something that's been photographed a million times. I mean, I've been to the Golden Gate and I photographed it. It's really cool. But what is it? Slacker Hill, right? Like, is that sort of where I think where I went and it's called Slacker Hill and you can walk around, there's yeah. some trees, there are a lot of things you can do, right? But yeah, for the most part, we've seen it. We've seen it with fog. We've seen it with stars. We've seen it with pretty much everything. But what's cool about that is when you can familiarize yourself with a location, uh, the more you do, the more creative you get. And, and I think that's really the key to sustainable travel photography or, or professional travel photography. It's so, yeah, we do go to get that hero shot because we need those hero shots for marketing. It, it's, it's so important, but it's all of those other shots that, that matter the most. And, and you have to be able to see things, you know, one in, in a way that not necessarily other people aren't seeing, but you, you have to be comfortable with it enough to not just see the the portfolio shot which you've seen you know so the one is to try to limit the amount of things that you research on it and try to explore and give yourself more time so it, it's curiosity exploration that, that's going to give you a unique perspective even if it ends up being something that's been done because you're right you physically can occupy <laughs> any space and now we have drones and, but it's still your idea and, and I think yeah. that you the more you go back to somewhere and it's like it's like with Rome is is that way for me because I spent so much time uh, staying with my uncle because it was free <laughs> and I, I knew the buses and I could take the bus. Uh, so I, I know the bridges and I know, I know those areas and I just practiced and went there just to go, you know, drink wine, shoot things. And so I'm so familiar with these things. I started to notice all these little details and all these little things and, and how it looks when it's flooded and how it looks when, you know, I, I even now I just saw a photo of it. And I'm like, man, they, there's another tree there. There's all these things. Like you start to notice these things that most people who just come to visit, like you said, it's temporary they don't get to discover. And sometimes that's what makes the shot. And that's important to understand. So familiarity is not a bad thing. It, it can actually be a, a better thing. You can produce better results. The problem, like you said, though, is it's you feel like it's always there. Mm -hmm. But we know now that, you know, again, it's been an interesting year. Things aren't always there. So I think in the back of your mind, you're still thinking too, Frederick, you're like, 
is it really going to be there? there are earthquakes? Mm-hmm. Like you don't know, you know, things are crumbling, rocks are falling, things are changing. And, and that's kind of where I'm at. I'm thinking, okay, yeah, we have hurricanes. And, and the more I put this off because I think it's so comfortable and permanent, the more sorry I'm going to be when it's gone, or right. I feel like I missed an opportunity or they built a fence around it or they, they did all these things. So you, you can't, you, you can't get yourself into a, a mindset where you can just feel like you can do it later. That's what I did, you know, mm-hmm. but you're right. It's never going to have the same excitement level, but what can I say about travel photography is when you, the way the Instagrammers do it, it looks exciting. Like they're really, you know, having that glass of wine in that infinity edge pool and <laughs> food. Yeah. And they, they are for that, you know, three hours it takes them to get that shot. <laughs> well, we know the stories of what goes into this. And I think that's really it, you know, for every, uh, you know, portfolio hero shot that you see, you're not seeing the hundreds or dozens of not, it's not like they're horrible, but they're, they're usable shots for marketing. You know, we're shooting extra things. We're shooting different things. It might not be exactly what I wanted and certainly trying to get that wow factor shot, but you have to be able to see, uh, things, even in the things that are the most mundane to you. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's the lesson, you know, and, and that's where your backyard can become literally when you say it's like, well, it's my backyard. I know it, you know, it's like the back of my hand. You, you have an advantage. You have the home field advantage. You just have to make yourself, you know, use it. And I'm failing at that. So I, I'm letting, I'm giving you advice. And then I'm like saying, I haven't been able to do it. So it's yeah, easier yeah. said than Isn't done. Isn't that always the way though? Like, that's always the way, you know, it, it's, yeah, it's so interesting. Cause I look at this stuff and I think, you know, I, I want to, you want to go out and you want to shoot but and you want to experience different things like Rome, like you said, and you know, who knows what's going to happen tomorrow. I remember a discussion that we had in an interview we did early on, uh, maybe a year or so, maybe uh, a little bit more than a year ago, uh, you and I were talking about, or you were telling me the story about this place, I think it was in China or Japan or someplace, this garden that was not very well trafficked and you were able to do some photos there and it became popular maybe because of the photos or for some other reasons. And now it's overrun with tourists and not the same place again. Do you, can you, do you recall it. that? That's the trade of pagoda. It's the, you'll see the, the, the pagoda, the red pagoda on the right, uh, Mount yeah. Fuji in the background and cherry blossoms or fall colors in the foreground. Yeah, that's, that was, um, it wasn't my discovery, but it was, I had, I found something like that that looked like a drawing or a picture, a thumbnail and, my friends had kind of turned me onto that years ago because nobody could figure out where it was and if it existed. And my friend and lived in the town. He's like, no, that's in our town. We just built it. Um, and yeah, it was not a, a place that anybody went except for locals, you know, like most of the <clears throat> places that are like a bunch of steps to get to. And it was like, I think it's like 150, 200 steps to get to that part. And then there's the mountain area and, um, you know, every step is a blessing. Mm-hmm. That's what they say, yeah. you know, but it was empty for years and um, now it's a tourist attraction, but it deserves to be because that was at the time I was really into the idea of if you look at something, it should say what it is. And mm-hmm. and that was an example where you don't have to think too hard about that. You're like, that's Japan. You have Mount Fuji, you have cherry blossoms, you have a uh, Japanese style pagoda, even though it's new, you know, it doesn't look new. And it has all of these, these representations of Japan in a single photograph. And, uh, you know, that was, I spent a couple of years trying to get that just right. But that's, that's a good example. Um, a lot of the natural arches are falling, different things like that change. Um, and yeah, that, that I think is probably uh, before everything, like you said, froze, you know, cause we're falling mm-hmm. out. That was the biggest challenge I had was managing the amount of tourists. And, you know, we're tourists, like everybody's a tourist who's not uh, from there, but <clears throat> it was, it was wild, you know, it was right around 2013 to 2015 um, when we started seeing the masses of tourism, the Chinese tourism, everybody all over the world. It's not just the Chinese coming there, massive buses, uh, you know, Iceland's just overrun with people. And at the beginning it was, it was okay because nobody was getting up at 5 AM, you know, and then in Iceland, it's like nobody was going in the wintertime and Norway, nobody was going in the wintertime. Nobody was going this time. And then after a few years, it was like winter became a destination. Uh, people would get up in the morning. The buses figured out that if they go in the morning, then they'll be able to give people an exclusive experience. So empty. Well, not really. I mean, empty with your 60 people you don't know. But <laughs> it, it just, it changed. And and it, it was wild to me. And I think that that's kind of neat right now if you think about it. So everybody says and everybody thinks that travel would have been better if I started 20 years ago. 
I, I talked to people like, oh, I was there in the 70s and the 60s? And it's like this. And I'm like, man, that would have been so cool to experience that back then. And we tend to devalue because things become modern. And certainly gift shops, tourists, you know, the, the people selling stuff, whatever, the mini Eiffel Towers or whatever, you know, it does, it does not really paint a, a classic picture of things, mm -hmm. but we, we have to think about it in terms of what is somebody going to say 20 years from now? They're going to be like, wow, you had the experience of a lifetime that has changed so much. And I think that now, no matter what age we are having, uh, you know, all kind of gone through this together in some way, we, we've seen rapid change and uncertainty and, and we've kind of applied that to the what if of everything. So mm -hmm. for travel and stimulation, it, now that uh, everything is thawing out, there's this unique opportunity. If you are going to travel, if you want to manage some of the restrictions or um, well, there's hoops and things that you have to jump through or, or tests that you have to take, you will largely experience the world the way it was before uh, mega modern tourism. And, and that's mm -hmm. something that I never expected to see again. You know, I never expected the idea of if I fly to Florence or Venice right now, uh, there are only a few cruise ships there. You know, it, it's not 15, you know, yeah. it, it's going to be so manageable during the day, which I haven't been able to experience for 10 years. So I'm thinking about that and maybe not even in the terms of photographing it, just to get to experience a place where I don't have to plan my entire day around the traffic of people. That's pretty cool. And then, then that's yeah. getting back to like the people who did it 20, 30 years ago when they weren't, well, they were tourists, but it wasn't as easy, you know? And, and that, so that's yeah. an interesting, and it's this incentive now, if you're trying to, if you want to travel, this is something to think about. It's, it is a little bit more of a hassle. Uh, you know, it, it's tough with the flights. If you look at it, they are booked up for the most part, but you get a unique experience again. Mm -hmm. And, and you, for you now. really do. For, for now, now, for now, right. You know, what's interesting about that is, you know, you're the perfect person to ask this question to. And that's the the idea of when when people are going on these these adventures, like we say, as the world is thawing out and, you know, you're, you, people are getting out and about again, especially photographers that want to get out and about and start taking photos again. Should should people, in your opinion, be shooting for the memory card or for their own memory? Right. So we, we have, that's a really good question. We have uh, a term that we actually call memory photos. Um, and, and that's kind of like, I'll have, I'll look through my photos on my iPhone because I'm usually shooting my daughter on my iPhone. And that's certainly changed a lot of things for me, obviously being a parent, but these are the things that you, you, you take out and show people more often than your portfolio. You know, here's the photos, you know, the barbecue, here's the, here's all the photos in between me obsessing about getting a great photo on my my real camera. Uh, yeah. and, and I think that that's really important to do both. So the majority of the photos will end up being memory photos. And I actually like that term. And in, in Southeast and East Asia, they, they're really good at coming up with terms like that. Like they're like, Oh yeah, memory photos. Cause I described it. I'm like, you know, those photos that you don't really keep your portfolio, but you show everybody. Yeah. Memory photos. We shoot those all the time. Mm -hmm. So this is really important. It can be both. And, and I think that we lose that if, if we're only thinking about generating portfolio work, whether it's you're, you're creating NFTs, trying to get to the front page of 500px or client, whatever you're trying to do, there's a lot of pressure. But the memory photos don't have any pressure. We're not, well, maybe we are. I obsess with all the vertical lines in my iPhone, but <laughs> I know that it, it doesn't have to be perfect because I'm just like, man, this was so cool. Or I'm, I'm taking detailed photos of something that I think is a cool texture or, you know, the deer and Nara or, you know, it doesn't, doesn't matter what it is, you know, and this is... This is the reason that most people travel, you know, that's then, and, and, and I think that that's a good way of, if we get too serious in our photography, we should always look back at what we shot about on the iPhone, because at that point we, uh, cut all expectations off, right? We don't have an expectation for this being shared on national geographic, uh, social media, you know, it's right. just, that was really a cool, a cool texture on that statue with moss on, you know, and, but we were excited about it. That made us excited. And then we didn't think about quality. We didn't think about too much and we just captured it, you know, so that, if you can take that and apply that to everything, then, you know, that, that's the best of both, right? That's the yeah. curious, curious traveler and, and the person who could, you know, set their tripod up and do it right too, if they really wanted right. to. Yeah. Why do you have to separate one from the other? Like you could, you could enjoy taking photos of say your meal at, at a Parisian restaurant or something Yes, and, and also enjoy the meal. Right. <laughs> you can. Well, yeah. Can. And, and, and this is it, you know, are you, you know, gonna post it to your Instagram? Probably not. 
but maybe you are. And if there's nothing wrong with that, I don't want to make the comments even worse than that anime thing he did. Um, <laughs> hey, you have, said I that. Mean, you said it. I did. I did. No. I'm well, going to type know, in your phone number right now. Just text him anything that you really text know. Me. <laughs> yeah, 310 now. Um, okay, so so here here's another question I want to throw out at you. So when you when you say we're on this hypothetical trip, let's say it's to Georgia, right? Uh, you know, not the Georgia here in the U.S., the Georgia over there by Russia, right? So it's, yeah, going, yeah, it's a bit, it's on my list actually. It's one of my favorite places. Too. Yeah, I have a friend that's traveling good, there good. right now. He's there right now, uh, which is mm-hmm. why it's top of mind. So I'm thinking, uh, I don't know if they're hit by the floods or not, but but I'm thinking. If you were to, if someone were to say, "Okay, Elia, you're going to Georgia tomorrow," uh, what what happens from then? Now, now let's put let's put some parameters on it. It's not a this is not a commercial assignment. This is just you got a free trip to Georgia. You got some free time. You got a place to stay. You're going to be there for three days. You know, two travel days. Um, book ending that. What do you bring with you? Like camera wise, clothes wise, what does that look like? If you're leaving tomorrow morning to go to Georgia, what happens after we get off the call right now? Uh, well, that, that's actually a good question. So it's it, having such little time, you're going to, you're yeah. going to fly into Lisi and that's, that's going to, I mean, it's cool. There are some things to shoot there. Um, I think that what I do is, is probably use it as a initial experience for, uh, transition into planning the next one, because if it's paid for, so in, in, in that world, yeah, you win a, you win a contest and they mm-hmm. fly you in and you get three days at the spa and to BC and you can go see the sites and everything. And that's great. You know, I, I would yeah. bring the camera and the tripod because you're going to have a couple sunsets and sunrises and there's architecture. It's a really neat city. I haven't been yet, yet. Uh, <laughs> thanks for reminding me. Uh, but it, it, you know, there's enough to do, but what I'd also do is I, I'd meet with, um, some local contacts there. Like I, I know people in different companies like that I have been wanting to go and, and talk to people. So from a networking standpoint, and this is just pure, you know, business side and networking, yeah. I'd say that's friends and colleagues and everything. I'd, I, I'd meet and everybody that I want to meet in person there. And, and I'd sort of run my ideas by them because what I'll do um, and by I'll do, I mean, I'll get Naomi to do because she does a better job of it is, is figure out the logistics of how to get from place to place. If I want to go to the monasteries and the mountains or it's all these things, usually we'll do a pretty good job. But if you talk to somebody local, they're going to be like, oh, you could do it this way or I do this first or mm-hmm. that's a bad idea because it's going to be busy or that's an orthodox holiday or you know what I mean? Like you can actually start to really learn a lot about it. And, you know, and when you take the expectation, that's the hard thing. I, I, I learned a long time ago that if I, I just have a day or two in a place, um, I, I, I will not do that. I'm going to break next speed, see everything for five minutes and just mm-hmm. go everywhere and run myself ragged. I'll, I'll try to just enjoy the things that I might have missed out if I did that. So the cultural stuff, the museums and we see the people, the cuisine, and, and then maybe like I'll get a lot of information. And also inspiration and other ideas that I wouldn't have had uh, just talking to people while I'm outside of the country. Mm-hmm. So that's unique to me. Um, but if you're there, that's that's the thing. Don't try to fill it with quantity. Uh, you know, unless the doctor gives you like two weeks to live, then you know, just go. Right. Don't sleep. Right. Just get it all done. <laughs> yeah. Just try to try to focus on a couple things. Like, and, and that's really where if I only have a day, two days, half a day, um, I'll focus on those big iconic shots. You know, I'll be yeah. like, I want a city sh- with the mountains. I want this. And I'll really try to get a couple things. And I, and I won't say I'm going to get 10, 15 portfolio pieces. I'm, if I get one, I'll be happy. And then I'll also have all the memory photos because I know that in the middle time, I'm, I'm not going to spend time working on the, you know, on Zoom and all these other things. I'm, I'm just going to go out and I'm going to walk around. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, take taxis to different places. I'm going to get recommendations from people. I'm going to meet people when I'm out you know, you know, drinking at the bar and, and then they're going to say, go here. And that's, that's really what I, I do. And, and, and I feel like, I don't know if I do it well, um, all the best times, the most successful times is too much alcohol. And I don't remember, I guess it was successful. <laughs> uh, is, awesome. that, is that networking? Is that, is that applying that same curiosity to this place? And what's cool is again, you're an outsider. It's very foreign for most people, very exotic, exotic's about wrong word. It's, 
it's unfamiliar or mm -hmm. familiar, but new and, and inspirational. There are a lot of ways where you can be stimulated by this, uh, this culture, the people, the history, the food, whatever it is, you know, it's just, it, it's a very cool place. So you get to apply that, uh, level of curiosity and excitement to somebody who's been there for a long time. And, when somebody comes here, hint, hint, if you want to drive over to the better coast, you come here and you're like, what is there to photograph? I'll be like, well, there are like 10 things and I'll get excited, even though I'm not excited. But then I'm excited because yeah. you made me excited. So I'll go there and I'll make everybody else excited. And they'll be like, you know what? When you come next, I'm going to take you to this place that nobody knows about. And we're going to do this. And I find that it, it usually takes me a couple of visits before I get to those places that I really intended to get. I just didn't know it at the time, you know, because again, there are a lot of great photos of everywhere and they tend to be in the same spot, but yeah. it's just because that's the easy thing. And most people don't go for very long. You start repeating things, then you can get comfortable with that place. And it's yeah. no different than how comfortable you can be with your own home. It's just that is exciting because it's new. You're learning something it's new different. every time you go. It's yeah, different. it's different. You know, and, and the, the other, the other part of that is, the, the, if it, me, you know, going, it's all about me, Elias. So I'm going to bring it back to me again. So when I, I still like you for some reason, it's like, no, <laughs> I know. you know, so I just, I talk to you and then I feel better about myself. It's like, I'm a pretty good person <laughs> compared to him. Exactly. Just he's so self-centered and he has a, he's bad ideas about anime. <laughs> uh, but you know, when you, when you think about gear on a trip like this, the knee jerk reaction for a lot of, let's say advanced amateur and amateur photographers is to, crap i'm going to georgia i don't know what's going to happen there you know let's let's assume they haven't researched and they haven't done what you're recommending and kind of making sure they hit the hot spots and all that but if you know the part kind of the knee-jerk reaction would be i got to bring everything with me i need these five lenses i need two camera bodies because what if one fails you know there might be some good aerials there i need to bring my drone too maybe some 360 stuff let me grab the 360 camera bring that along and on and on and on i need batteries for all this stuff and chargers should i bring my laptop too yeah because i might want to stream and edit while i'm in the hotel room laptops in the bag oh i may want to read at a cafe let me throw let me throw my ipad in the bag too now i need clothes you know and pretty soon you've you're just overloaded from you a, a the intentional homeless guy right that traveled the world i'm assuming efficiently what's what's the best way to do that to avoid that overload and having that charlie brown backpack full of gear well it, it, it depends on the mentality of mm -hmm. i want to be able to capture anything that I could possibly imagine in any way that I could possibly imagine yeah. versus the reality of the locations that I'm going to be going to. So what I learned was that <clears throat> the more you do something, the worse you get at it. Sometimes it's, it's the weirdest thing. Like you start That's to, so true. you know, it's like, okay, like 15 years of travel and you know, I'm a master of travel. It's like, no, I, I stopped paying attention to things that are important and then I miss shit. And it's like, <laughs> it will land. <laughs> Naomi would be like, what hotel we're staying at? And I'm like, oh, <clears throat> I didn't book anything. You, you didn't book anything. I was like, well, I was going to do it at the, all right, well, let me just, I'll book something when we land, you know? And so for me, you know, spontaneity is a little bit more important or planned spontaneity. We have, I can talk about all those uh, controlled variables and stuff, but it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, <laughs> I'm just thinking about that. I've done that so many times. Tomorrow. What landed? What landed someplace? And you're like, I have no. We don't know where we're staying. That that's like the worst well, nightmare I, to me. I don't ever really know. I mean, I yeah. booked it, but I don't have it all figured out. You know, I'll just like figure it out when I get there. Or show an How address. Do you do to that? Like that? That just it's, that just tap dances on my OCD vein, right? Because it's like it's like. I, I, Oh, it, you, like when you land, when I get on a plane, like even when I get in the, when I get in the, the car to go to the airport, I feel like I have to know where my bags are going to be that night. And you're so like I, James Bond since I here. Did the, I took us out of that question. Let me see if I can answer this one and answer the other one. So okay. Yeah. Bring us back. Bring you know, back. The gear thing. Yeah. It, so there's a, um, embracing the random is something that can be done really well. Like it doesn't mean that I don't know the area. Usually it's areas that I've been, you know, if, if I'm going to Istanbul for something and I don't, I don't really worry about it. I'll just know where I'm staying and then I'll make sure I have the address. And now we land and we have data. And I mean, it was different 10 years ago, 12 years ago. And I'm saying, you know, back in my day, we had paper maps instead of Google maps, but we did. We had freaking paper maps. Mm -hmm. We had a paper map in Tokyo. And I'm like, the hell do I do this? Oh, that's the subway. Whoa, that doesn't include the trains. 
or these trains or the monorail and then like all the layers and i'm like uh, do you have an english one no no but you know go here walk here that was an adventure and and i think that taught me a lot there's there's a there's a practice in spontaneity right like i'm just not yeah. i just throw myself into dangerous situations but I, I i'm confident in my abilities to figure things out and the more you travel the more comfortable you get everywhere in the world things change um, and you adapt and, and you, you can kind of fit in. You, you, you understand the way things work. You know, when you land in your hometown, you don't really think too much about everything you do. And once you get somewhere, once you learn that place, then it, it's, it's largely the same. Um, and it doesn't mean that I won't plan, but I, I just, it's just a different mentality. Type A and type B. Like, and that's why my wife and I work so well together. So it, it's similar to the gear stuff, you know. And I, and I think that's what hard, what's hard is even if you plan everything out, it's always, it always comes down to, do I need that 24 to 70? Or I'm sorry, do I need that 70 to 200? Do I need that telephoto lens? And it sucks because every time I try to use a smaller camera bag, and for a while I got a really small camera bag, and but I limited, you know, I'm taking a one wide angle, one medium, that's it. And, and then like, I'm not going to shoot any telephoto. And, and usually I'd be happy with that. But the very practical me thinking, as we all do that, I'm going to have all these opportunities to get all these crazy shots mm -hmm. that, and I, I'd rather have something than not have something. And yep. it, it's one of those things that you can never really master. So what I did is I started to think of it as everything that I bring versus everything that I take out. So if I was going to go shoot one thing or one place a day, which is very realistic for me, one or two, um, and I can go back to the hotel in between or wherever, I don't need to take everything. So what I do is I, I take the smaller bag in my suitcase um, it's like a day bag, a, a camera bag, right? My ideal, if everything was perfect, this is what I travel with all the time. And then I load everything into the bigger bag and take it if I need it. Mm -hmm. And then depending on where I'm going, I pack what I need. So I get things there and then I convert it into what I need for the day. So I'm not hauling everything around. That's a pretty good solution. If you can find a sort of a day or a two day bag. Um, another thing that's kind of cool in the hotels like if you stay somewhere, say you're going to, you're going to go to Thailand, you're going to go all through the North, but you're going to start <laughs> in Bangkok and then you're going to end in Bangkok. We're well, going to spend probably 24 hours there. So what you can do is you can book a hotel for that 24 hours and then book it two weeks later. So you show the two bookings. When you get there, when you leave, you can store a bag. So you can store some of your stuff and then be lighter and more agile. So wow. that's the trick. So you, you have to kind of plan for that. And, and, you know, I have all these, these bags that kind of collapse into nothing. And then I can make another bag if I have to check a second bag. Um, it, it, it's a little bit more planning, but I don't think this is, I don't think anybody's capable of just leaving everything behind because if you're shooting, if you, if you decide like, I'm only going to shoot 85 millimeter portraits of people on the street that's pretty cool. Like you can just do that. But for landscape photography and you just like can't even discount the need for a telephoto, you might need it. And then when you shoot the wide angle, you might want to do detail shots and it just, it's never easy to, to call that stuff. And then filters, you know, mm -hmm. you got to get it down to like 10 stop. And do you really need the grad? Probably not. You doing video. Yes. Like, it never ends, to be it honest. And then, yeah, the drone. Thankfully, they're very small and compact. I have to hand it to DJI. It's changed a lot. It just just yeah. to be able to have like a small, powerful, you know, complete video solution that takes up the place of one lens. I mean, that that's, that's right. Right I don't complain about pocket. taking the drone. Pretty much, yeah, 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 yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, and that the 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 safety part of it, I think, is where where you know myself and a lot of people get tripped up at because you want to bring all that stuff with you like you say and yeah i think of it like you know you have your battleship back in the hotel room and then you have your away team you know that takes just what you need for the mission for that day and then you go back and you know reassess but what happens to the battleship when you're out like you touched on it but if you know if you got this bag with forty thousand dollars worth of gear sitting in your room in a in a country where forty thousand dollars represents a lifetime income, you know there's there's dynamics at play there. What if someone follows you back and they see this foreigner shooting with this expensive gear? There may be more back at the room. Let's go get them. How do you, you know, the, there's the fear part of that. Like, okay, I'm just not going to go anywhere because I don't. You know, there may be bad people there that are going to do evil things. 
Or do you just throw caution to the wind and say, hey, YOLO, I'm going out, I'm going to do my photography and nothing's going to happen. And if it does, I'll deal with it. How do, how do you reconcile that? Well, there's kind of a saying that if you're, if you want to get a new camera, you know, get, in, get insurance and then visit Rome, you know, it, it's, it's gonna, <laughs> it's, it's going away, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, this dark alley looks dodgy. Don't go down it, but the, mm-hmm. <clears throat> there are a couple of ways to do that. And, and yeah, we definitely try to use the safe. Um, so you can utilize the safe to put some stuff in. And then if it's one of the small ones, you can, you can actually just hide things in the room. It's, it's very, um, you know, Michael Creighton spy, you know, thing like you take a roof tile off or you don't have to get that creative, but you can just slide stuff under like between the mattress and the the box spring, you can put your laptop and stuff. There are also, if I was in, um, places where I I was questionable and to doing that in in China and leaving your stuff there, not that it's going to be a problem. You never know. Right. And, Mm -hmm. and most of the places that are, are tourist, uh, oriented, they, they don't want theft because that's going to give them, I mean, one theft is going to ruin their review. So they, they really don't want that to happen. Islands in Greece, like that's their whole reputation. Like anybody who steals is getting booted off the island. It's like that one guy on Survivor that just goes, you know, like he's yeah, gone yeah. right away. But you can use something like a pack safe. I don't know if you've seen those. No. It's it's that. like a it's like a wire uh, grid. Like it's not chicken wire. It's like really you have to get it bolt cutters to get through it. And it comes with a lock and they make it the size. They make bags. But they make it the size of camera bags, the size of rollers the sides of things. So if you're worried about that, you can take like, take the light backpack, right. With the gear and then take the rest of it in a roller or another bag on the plane and get a pack safe that'll fit over that, uh, you know, that, that, uh, approved roller board size. Mm-hmm. Then it has like a tether cord that you can wrap around stuff and lock. So what I'd actually do is I'd, I'd put everything in there, put the mesh on it, crank that down and lock it. And then I'd wrap it through the uh, hinges on the door on like the, you know, and then lock it, you know? And so anybody who came in there, like for smash and grab, like would not be able to do it. They're not, they're not going to get it. They're not going to be able to break it off. You know, somebody would have to work there. It would take a lot. So we locked the bags up in places that were questionable like that. So that's uh, a very doable thing. Um, The one thing I advise against is, unless you're in Iceland or Japan or somewhere where this just doesn't happen, you you know, I mean, you're in California, you just don't leave your stuff in the car, right? Mm -hmm. Like never, ever, ever leave your stuff in the car before you go on a walk um, in any national park. So there are certain things in that regard. If you are going to go shoot, I make sure that I can at least drop stuff off at the hotel before I go somewhere. If I'm going to have to Mm -hmm. hike or if we've, you know, done this with a group and we hire a guide, we usually just have, if we have a driver, we'll just ask them to stick around the car to, to watch everything, you know? So we're very cautious and we try to plan around it, but there, there certainly are some things like pack safe and, and some other solutions like that, that you can, you can secure your stuff. And, you know, it works really well. And, and, and honestly, it's gotta look so weird to the cleaning staff, you know, like all of these like Fort Knox style bags <laughs> that are lashed around different things and yeah. locked down, but it's, it's true. You know, you have to protect that. Yeah. Um, and global nomads and some other places like you can get great travel insurance, but nobody wants to be in that situation. Mm-mm. No, no. And that's the whole point. You know, one of, one of the, and, and we'll wrap it up after this, but one of the things that I, I think about is one of the cities that I, that's on my list, like Georgia is on your list is Rio de Janeiro, like for carnival yes. and all that. And then I think about it, I'm like, Oh, that would just be a dream to go down there and shoot that. It just looks amazing. And just the sights and the colors and the sounds and all that. And then I also heard that, yeah, it's kind of like Rome, you know, when it comes to your camera gear, you know, you gotta, you want to be careful and be smart about it. Any tips for, for for that, like if you if you're gonna go to an area that you know that has a reputation for shoplifting or robbery or you know bad things like that, but yet you still want to go and get the photos, what, what's your advice to those folks? Rio, in particular, uh, I think I've been three or four times it was years and years and years ago, um, and I never felt comfortable enough to just walk around with my camera gear mm. um, because it it is a problem. Um, and if you're staying in Ipanema or, you know, any, anywhere along the beach or basically anywhere, right? Like mm-hmm. they tell you not to wear anything flashy, take your jewelry off, all those kind of things. You know, it's just, it's just the nature of it. Um, so when you get there and you hear that and, and you're encouraged 
by the hotel and all that kind of stuff. And then we'll call a taxi just so that you don't get kidnapped or taken advantage of. Like, yeah, I mean, you don't want to hear that. It definitely doesn't play with your confidence. And mm-hmm. it was kind of heartbreaking to me driving around and seeing all these beautiful things. It was like, I can't come here by myself in the morning. I just, mm-hmm. I can't. Mm-hmm. And and the solution is having local friends that can sort of buffer and be around you because they know better and they know, you know what I mean? It's getting to be where some of the tourist areas, again, there's security, there's, there's, there's things going on, but you really have to limit the amount of things. And, it, and it's good to sort of disguise it a little bit because camera bags that look like camera bags, you don't want it to just be like scream, you know, expensive camera. And, and you don't want to be kind of flaunting that. So you have to be a little bit more um, discreet and, and blend in. But I think the best thing you can do is, is get somebody to go with you. And I, and I know you can, you can do that pretty easily with tours and stuff where they'll go. So you get like the sunset on Sugarloaf to be able to get the that nice cityscape that everybody gets with mountains and you're there with a group of people, you know, so then I'd say embrace the small tour group because you're going to be, you know, there with a bunch of people and, and it's going to be a little bit more safe, but that's definitely a, the tricky situation. Um, and, and I think Rio is one of those really interesting places that it's so beautiful and, and also so tricky in that regard. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's somewhere that I, I, I'm ready to, to revisit sort of with the gear. And I think that what you can do is just always be conscious that it could happen. So when you're done shooting, just take your memory cards out just in case you, you lose the camera. Cause really what it comes down to is if you've been shooting, then the images are the most important thing, you know, if you've got images. So keep those memory cards somewhere else in a sock, they make these, uh, like chest, uh, and, and, and body sort of um, can conform things that you can keep your money. And one of the funniest things that somebody told me in Rio, which actually people do, um, they're like, so when you get robbed, it's, it's never like if you get robbed, right? They say, when you should have a dummy wallet. And and it's mm-hmm. the weirdest thing. Like you, you basically have like a wallet or two on you and you put some money and, and some stuff, like put some old credit cards in there and that don't work anymore or whatever. And then when somebody robs you, just you hand them that. And then they take it and go. It's a dummy wallet. And they're happy that they they robbed you. And then you, you keep all your stuff. So if you keep dummy wallets on you, I've never wow. had to do it. But I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this. Um, you should definitely, definitely be, be careful. And, and I think that, it, again, it's, it, you, just have to, you just have to accept the fact that it might happen. But what, what you really want to do in those situations, even if you think like you can accept everything gets stolen, you, do, you still don't want to go to a place that's notoriously dangerous by yourself. Like I have friends who, who are in, in the favelas and taking photos, but they're accepted by the community. They've done a lot of work before mm-hmm. they go in there um, with social outreach and stuff like that to be able to photograph and, and have access to those people and those stories. But just as a tourist walking around, I mean, it's like you, you have to, you have to kind of read the room. And, and I think that as a traveler, you, you, I mean, if you're from the city, if you're from New York or I'm, I mean, I'm from South Florida, Miami is a crazy place. It's always been a crazy place and you don't stop at red lights at night. You just, you just know not to do that. So you kind of have to apply that same logic when you travel. You just, just don't, don't put yourself in a situation where you know it's going to be bad. And nine times out of 10, if, if something in the back of your head is telling you that this is a mistake and that something's going to go wrong, trust it, trust it. Just go tomorrow. There have been so many times that I've gotten up in the morning and I was going to go walk somewhere and I just decided this isn't a good time to do it. And then Mm -hmm. I've just stayed. So just, it's, you know, separating the paranoia from it, just think it through and, 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 and trust your gut. But you know, you also don't want it to limit you. Um, so that would be one of the more difficult examples, but European cities and New York, uh, you know, all the, they, they, you're fine. You know, you're, you're really fine. Just, just really understand not to go down that dark alley or, or anything that feels weird. You know, you just have to kind of use that same street smarts or common sense that you have at home, um, somewhere else, but you shouldn't just automatically assume that somewhere else is, is worse necessarily, you know? And I think a lot of people are in the United States, like you know, where's the scariest place you've ever been. I'm like Newark, New Jersey, you know, like that really <laughs> is freaked out trying to take the Metro. It's there, the, the, the path train at, at 2 AM and it's not, Ugh. not good, you know? Yeah. So after that, I mean, what is Rome at, you know? 2 a.m. Like exactly, not, yeah. Not, and I'm from Chicago. So I'm, I'm from Chicago, okay, there, yeah. so there's like you know, it, it takes a lot to freak me out, but it also hones your your self preservation and kind of the instinct about, like you said, don't go down that alley and just don't be an idiot, right? Don't go into this place in this area at 2 a.m. It's probably not a good idea, or like you said, slowing down for red lights or anything like that, you know. 
And you take those kinds of sensibilities to, and, and kind of extrapolate out that, yeah, this, this planet is full of humans and some of them do stupid stuff. Right. So, so yeah, just, being curious, being, yeah. you know, excited and, and adventurous doesn't mean you have to be, you know, reckless and, right. and put yourself in danger. You know, there, there are two different sides to that. And, and I think that, you know, a lot of the, the photography, we see people like climbing to the top of the buildings and the daredevil stuff, you know, that's a whole different thing That's different. where that, yeah. that safety thing they're putting in the line. But a lot of the photographers, if you really want to watch people that are doing that, I and mean, you see a lot of the photojournalism, that photojour- photojournalism, excuse me, that, that's happening in, um, you know, Pakistan and uh, the Rohingya and um, in the West of Myanmar, even uh, Myanmar right now, you know, so the, the, these are the people that are putting themselves uh, on the line every day and, and in danger to get these photos. And these photos aren't for their portfolio. They're so that these news stories gets out, you know? So this is, this is a little different than us wanting to travel to Rio just to get some cool portfolio shots. You know, this is people risking their lives to help, uh, help change the lives of people and get these stories out there. So I usually look to them for advice and, and, you know, kind of talk to them about how it actually is. And, and, uh, you know, they, they really inspire me. I have a lot of really good friends and happy to call friends that, that are out there changing the world. Um, and it just reminds me, you know, that, you know, like, you know, take photos of pretty landscapes, you know, they got them pretty good mm-hmm. compared to this, the safety thing, but, um, just, you know, and that clarify your intentions, right. You're like, I'm going to put myself in danger just because I want to, you know, get a, get a, you know, hundred thousand likes on Instagram. It's probably not a great reason to do it. You know, yeah. you might want to reassess your values there. <laughs> want to help, help, you know, stop a genocide is probably a better reason than, than increasing your Instagram following. <laughs> you don't want, you don't want on your, your tombstone to read, he did it for the gram, right? That's He did it for the gram. Yeah. Or like the obituary he had, he had a million Instagram followers. Like that's uh-huh. your, that's what you want to be remembered for. It's yeah. not that great really. Yeah. <laughs> Well, what's what's next as we wrap this up? What what's next for Elia? What, what's a uh, what's on the travel ticket? What's you know, business wise? You always have something crazy going on. What's going on? What's what's happening for the rest of twenty twenty one? I have a lot of things that aren't uh, moving forward. Not because I don't want them to, but because I'm I'm kind of hesitant because there's so many ideas out there. And what what I'm doing now is just just kind of either thinking about the most ridiculous thing that I could do and then pitching it and see how it goes. Um, or I'm trying to uh, sort of apply a, a beginner's mind to everything. And I think right now, a lot of us, uh, hobbyist or professional, we're in this unique situation where we've been home a lot and maybe we put down the camera. It, it's kind of like, I grew up around the ocean, so I'm used to it. But, but even if I spend a year or two outside of the ocean, no matter how comfortable I was with it, when I come back to it, it, there's always that fear in the back of my head until I get comfortable with it again. You know, I'm hesitant. I'm I'm worried, you know, the sharks or whatever that reason is. It's, it's relatable to our professions and our hobbies and our passions too. If we're adamantly pursue something, we open Photoshop every day, we pick up our cameras and get out of the house and we get used to this. You put that down for a little while and you start to feel a little bit more intimidated about creating or it doesn't feel as fluid or easy because it's not as natural and, and, um, familiar. Mm -hmm. And if you've, if you've taken yourself out of photography for a while, just because you've had to focus on other things like surviving, then when you pick it up again, you start looking and, and, and seeing everything, it feels like everything's changed, you know, NFTs, people are doing that now. They're NFT artists. They're not photographers. Um, everything feels different. So you can feel like that's past you and then somehow you need to catch up or you need to start doing that. And then, then it's suddenly there's all of this pressure, pressure is self-imposed. The need to pick up the camera pressure that I need to get on this because I'm going to miss out on, on whatever this NFT thing is. Um, you know, or even if you know it, it's fear, you know, the FOMO is going to happen. And, and mm-hmm. what that does is it just applies pressure, applies pressure, applies pressure. And, and that inhibits creativity, you know? So it's not easy again, but what I'm doing is just sort of, you can call it going back to the drawing board or just applying the beginner's mind to say, well, what can I do now? And and I'm going to lean on some of my strengths and then I'm going to work on some of my weaknesses. And I'm just going to kind of do stuff and and come up with ideas until something else clicks, you know, something I haven't thought of, you know, borrow some uh, experience from something else I've, I've done or um, right now, actually I, I acquired a, um, a vintage camera collection. I hate showing how messy all this stuff is over here, but I have, I have oh, actually like that. hundreds of cameras and there's a roll of flexes and on the right, there are these old, you know, the brownies and stuff. I, I have some like 
eight millimeter film cameras from the sixties and seventies. Um, you know, even some really cool stuff like the, this is one that's ready to shoot with. That's been cleaned up the Voigtlander prominent, you know, like all these really cool things in film. So I'm kind of going back to that. Not, not that I'm going to say I'm going to shoot everything on film. Like I'm not, I have a lot of ideas. I'm not sure what is going to be done first, but it's actually kind of looking back at, at, at history and, and just thinking about things differently, you know, rather than looking towards the future, I'm kind of thinking about the now I'm trying to keep it right here and, and just kind of come up with ideas. Like if I hadn't been doing everything that I've been doing, would I still do it? You know, I've been home long enough. I have a, a daughter who I love to be around, you know, can I be gone for 11 months out of the year to, to keep exploring these ideas or, is there something close to home or I, I'm, I'm asking myself these questions with, without applying pressure to the outcome. And, mm. and I'm starting to come up with some interesting ideas and things that I might want to move forward on. And once they start to feel natural, they start to feel kind of fun. And then those intimidating things start to uh, uh, come into play. You know, if you just think I'm going to solve, I'm, I get into Instagram now and, and do all this stuff, uh, or I'm going to, you know, start selling NFTs on, on foundation you start thinking about these other things, you're actually building it from a foundation rather than reverse engineering it. You know, for Instagram, we're, we're telling a story backwards. We start with the photo and then we figure out how to tell the story. Um, with NFTs, we're like, okay, how can I build stuff for NFT so that I can sell it? You know, yeah. usually the best art and the best art that, that sells is stuff that kind of comes from the soul. We, we didn't usually have to apply this much technology to it in the past. So if you can come up with a foundation of something you love, then you'll start to connect the dots where, hey, this story, this project, this photography style, this thing, this might work for that rather than what can I make work for that? So you have to kind of take it back to that 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 foundation phase, uh, apply uh, the, the technique is the beginner's mind, which is, uh, you know, just assuming that you know nothing, which is I get told I know nothing all the time. And I, I agree with it. I, I, a, a daughter and a wife. So they, they constantly rag on me. But it's it goes as simple as saying, take the expectations off. Sure, if you have to shoot commercially, yeah, you can shoot commercially. But if you want to create something new, then create something new and don't conform to something you think you need to do because it's popular or something you've done before because you're comfortable with it. Apply some of what you've done and look for that thing that's that's just there. And if you start to feel like there's, some, there's something there, like I feel this all the time, like I'm like, I, I like this, there's something there. I'm looking at these old cameras shooting with these. I'm like, man, this is just so cool. There's something there. And then I get all these ideas and eventually I get to that little thing. And, and what's funny about all these new ideas and these things that I do, it's never something so far out there. It's always this thing that's, it just seems so obvious after you realize it. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's the nice thing about the beginner's mind and, and fresh eyes is you're like, you're not looking so far to do this thing that's so revolutionary. You're like, you just kind of come up with these ideas and then suddenly that's it. You know, it, it didn't have to be complicated. The people yeah. who win the Nobel Prize are like, I should have thought of that or that million dollar idea. You're like, I should have thought of that. It's so simple. It doesn't have to be complicated, but you have to give yourself the, um, you know, the flexibility and the environment to be able to sort of play with those ideas. Yeah, and, like, and that's kind of what we, we have time now. But the last thing I want, I want to wrap up on it. It's hard yeah. right now because we're, we've been, we've all been taking a break or doing something different or just doing the same thing in a different way. We have uh, technology has, has gone in a different direction. Everything's different. We're reading stories. 30% of the workforce in the United States is is quitting and following their dreams and people are changing their lives and transforming. And, you know, that's great. Like, I'm so happy for all those people, but that puts more pressure on us because now we're like, mm -hmm. I need to transform. Like I need to evolve. I need to take things to the next level. I need to do this because you feel like you're missing out on it and all these people are doing it. And you have to stop that. And you just have to say, nothing's really different. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the same. I, I don't have to do all those things just because other people do. And when you start taking those expectations and those uh, limitations or pressures off yourself, then you start to be creative again. So that, that's what you have to do. You have to just relieve all that pressure, step away from it for a second, take a deep breath, and just start creating stuff that you want to create, whether that's writing, drawing, photography, whatever it is. You just, just start creating and, and, and go into that space, and, and you just start to connect all these dots with ideas. And that's, that's where all this inspiration comes from. That, that's where all these great ideas come from. They just come from a place of, Oh, I'm just going to screw around today and mess with stuff, you know, because yeah. it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. It's like giving, giving yourself, it sounds like you're saying, giving, give yourself permission to experiment or be experimental versus living under the pressure of perfection 
and professionalism and creating professional work. Why not just, hey, I'm just going to try this. I'm going to play around with this. I'm excited about this. And then once you do that enough, you see patterns in the chaos and you can start connecting the dots. And yeah. Love and if it. it makes you feel better, if you look at my social media, you'll see that I might post once a month now. Like I've, I, it's not like I've abandoned it, but I've, I've gotten out of the mentality that I constantly have to talk about what I'm doing or all these things, you know, so separating myself from that has been great. Uh, So there there are certain things that you can do practically uh, to cut yourself off from certain things or remove it, you know, turn your phone off. Don't look at new, you know, all these things that you can do that will help, you know, do, do take some deep breaths or meditate in the morning. Just try to clear your head. These things are all valid, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Love it. I always come away from these conversations with you jazzed and excited. I got a page full of notes of things to go look, look at. I've got, I got to look up that map tunneling tool you were talking about. We were talking about I forget what it, you just like, <laughs> yeah, you got to search map tunneling tool. It'll like say you pick one side and it shows you exactly. Because so you know, our parents were like, you can eventually dig a hole to China. Remember that? Like yes. in the yard, like I'd be digging holes and like, you're going to dig a hole to China. And then, okay. I don't think China is actually under florida it's kind of over there a little bit yeah it you might miss it you might you might end up in the uh the mariana's trench or something right? <laughs> it's something like that yeah i mean yeah. it is in the middle of the ocean yeah. <laughs> actually yeah <laughs> who knows cool man all right so if if people want to like catch up with you see what you're working on you know or or check out the work that you've done already what's a what's a good location for them to point their browsers to Lately, it's just, uh, you know, I'll share some things on social media. I haven't shared about any events or anything. My website needs to be updated. But and, I mean, if you're curious about anything in particular, just just send me a message on, on, you know, Facebook or any social media, I'll get it or an email through the website. And then I'll update it, you know, once they're, they're we have some ideas for later this season and next year that we'll be able to involve other um, other people and bring people on board with projects and stuff. But right now, it's just the fun exploratory phase. And, you know, uh, once I have more solidity to that, I'll start sharing about it and, and sort of crowdsourcing. So then, then you might start to see some of these uh, sideline ideas that connect on social media. I want to see those cameras. I want to see those, those vintage cameras that you have multiplying around you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> those are amazing. Yeah. It's a, uh, yeah, it's always, man, it's always a pleasure talking to you. I feel like whenever we talk, I feel like I've just watched or participated in a really good Ted talk. That's what it feels like, you know, just that you ever watch a TED talk where you get these kind of revolutionary or eye opening ideas. It's that's what it feels like when we chat. So thank you. Thank you for doing. Oh, that. no, it's a pleasure. It's fun. It's fun. I mean, we should record the green room stuff next time. We totally should have. We totally like should've. every time it's like we should talk about that and save it for the interview. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah, we were just as we end this, we'll I'll leave them with the. Uh, a glimpse into our green room conversation. We're talking about the storyline behind the tomorrow war and we'll leave it at that. Was it good? I don't think we said storyline. I don't even think we used that (laughs) word (laughs) just to give you an idea. how The the soup, the soup that was tomorrow war, the soup of ideas that was tomorrow war. (laughs) It's one of those great movies where you think it's over and there's still an hour left. <laughs> like, still, what? what? That should have been the conclusion. All right, man. Well, I'll let you get on with it. You have a fantastic weekend. Uh, thanks for doing this and, and chatting with me. Uh, yeah, this is this is fantastic. I'm excited. And I'm gonna, I'll let you know when I book that next photography trip. I got a bunch of trips planned for different events, but most of them are either family or work. Um, yeah. I'm committed to booking just a, which I haven't really done ever, is just book a trip somewhere that I haven't been before explicitly for the for the sake of photography. So that's coming. Yeah, that's let me coming. know. It'd be good to to go. But that's another thing too. Like with a, I was traveling everywhere by myself, and I'm like, yeah, it'd just be easier to travel somebody else because you like play off each other's creativity. You know, I can steal all your shots, for example, and make you do all there the work. Yeah, you know, the real reasons behind that. You know, uh-huh. yeah, we should plan that. We should plan that. All right, man. Yeah. Uh, all right, you go enjoy that horrible Florida weather that you have to deal with. You know, <laughs> so, I will. Yeah, you enjoy yourself. Cool, man. I'll be in touch. And thanks for everything. I appreciate you. Yeah, take care. Thanks, everybody. This is Twitter. This episode was sponsored by MPB, the world's largest online platform for used photo and video kit. Visit MPB. 
www.thinkingmusicgroup.com.